Jesus, hear my plea. 
was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. My heart is filled with joy that the Lord gave me. I've been changed from that old man that I used to be. My life was changed forever when the Lord found me. He didn't leave me the way that He found me. He didn't leave me to die in my sin. He gave me freedom From my chains He set me free He took out The old things That I Aren't you glad he doesn't leave you the way that he found you? Amen. Amen. But he transforms you by the power of his Holy Spirit. What a wonderful God. Amen. Yeah. Amen. People, people want to come to God today and have no changes. Yeah. Listen, that's one of the wonderful things about coming to God is the changes. Right. Yeah. Really is. It's the things that he can do with a messed up, ruined life. Very and that he's still in the business, by the way. Of transforming messed up ruined lives. Amen. Well now let me just warn you. This is Tuesday night. Yep. What that means is we've only got one more night together. And so if you were going to invite somebody. Don't wait too long. Amen. You better do it tonight or tomorrow morning. Uh, if you expect them to be able to come this week. While we're here together. We have enjoyed ourselves. We always do. Always look forward to being here. And like I told you on Sunday, this is the first year, and as far back as I can remember, that there hasn't been at least one snowstorm while we were here. And it doesn't really matter what month we're here. That doesn't seem to matter. It's just we have a snowstorm while we're here. And uh, the Lord has seen fit to not let that happen this time. So uh, unless it happens, well, let's not even say that. <laughs> if you have your Bible handy, open up to the book of Judges chapter 6. And when you find that, would you stand with me if you're able to stand tonight? Judges chapter 6. I actually want you to find two passages in your Bible. Judges chapter 6 and Judges chapter 8. Both passages. They're probably just a page apart in your Bible. We're going to begin reading tonight in Judges chapter 6 and verse number 16. This is the story of the conquest of Jericho as the children of Israel come from 40 years of wandering in the wilderness and come across the Jordan River 
and they come to the city of Jericho and God gives them the instruction on how they should conquer the city. Look, if you would, at Joshua chapter 6 and verse number 16. And it came to pass at the seventh time when the priests blew with the trumpets, Joshua said unto the people, Shout, for the Lord hath given you the city, and this city shall be accursed, even it and all that are therein to the Lord. Only Rahab the harlot shall live, she and all that are with her in the house, because she hid the messengers that we sent. And ye in any wise keep yourselves from the accursed thing, lest ye make yourselves accursed when ye take of the accursed thing, and make the camp of Israel accursed and trouble it. But all the silver and gold and vessels of brass and iron are consecrated unto the Lord. They shall come into the treasury of the Lord. Now turn over a page, if you would, to Joshua chapter 8 and verse number 1. Excuse me, did I say judges at the beginning? Oh, well, you people are in the wrong book. <laughs> We're in the book of Joshua. I'm sorry. Shall we go back and look at that again? No, you, you know the story. Joshua chapter 6, Joshua chapter 8. Sorry about that. Brother Leafly, you've probably never done that, have you? Yeah. <laughs> you've probably never done that either, have you, preacher? I didn't think so. I'm the only one. I know I am. <laughs> Joshua chapter number 8, verse number 1. No wonder there were such bewildered looks on your face. <laughs> I'm intent on the story, and you're just looking weird. That's okay. Joshua chapter 8, verse 1. And the Lord said unto Joshua, Fear not, neither be thou dismayed. Take all the people of war with thee, and arise, go up to Ai. See, I have given into thy hand the king of Ai, and his people, and his city, and his land. And thou shalt do to Ai and her king, as thou didst unto Jericho and her king. Only the spoil thereof, and the cattle thereof, shall ye take for a prey unto yourselves. Lay thee in ambush for the city behind you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you. For the good day that you've given to us, Lord, thank you that we could be in your house tonight and fellowship together and rejoice together. And Lord, I pray that as we look at these familiar passages, that you would help us to do it with new eyes and to be able to apply this truth to our lives tonight. And we'll thank you and praise you for all that you do in our midst. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. If I was you, I'd turn back to Joshua chapter 6 real quick. <laughs> So you can see the last verse that we read with your own eyes. Joshua chapter 6, verse number 19. Here's the instruction that God gave to the Israelites after the walls fall down and they go in uh, to uh, win the battle. Here's the specific instruction he gave them. But all the silver and the gold and vessels of brass and iron are consecrated unto the Lord. They shall come into the treasury of the Lord. So for the, for the city of Jericho, they have specific instructions. For the city of Ai, they have specific instructions. You see here, as they, as they come to the city of Jericho, they're excited, no doubt. They've wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. They've just come across the Jordan River. They've seen God miraculously part the waters, and they go across the river on dry ground, and God delivers them the battle plan. Amen. What I want to preach to you about tonight is this. A tale of two cities. I told you I'm not a good title giver, so I stole the famous title from literature of days long model. Amen? Amen? A tale of two cities. Because there are two cities here, and, and something similar is going on in both places. You see, in both places, God is going to win a great and miraculous victory. That's what he's going to do. As a matter of fact, as they're getting ready to cross the Jordan River and go into the Promised Land, God tells them that's what he's going to do when they get in there. He's going to fight the battles. He's going to win the battles. It's going to be miraculous. And sure enough, they get there in chapter 6. And God says, I want you to get all the men of war. I want you to get everybody and march around the city. You know the story. You've got to march around every day for six days and then seven times on the seventh day. And at the end of those seven times on the seventh day, I want you to blow the trumpets and shout and the walls will fall down. And so they did. They, they marched around the city and they did it every day for seven days and seven times that seventh day. And I'm sure they were tired and frustrated and all the rest, but they did it all. Right. And then they blew the trumpets and they shouted with a great shout. And I read it to you while you were over there in the book of Judges. Don't know what you're doing there. 
And what they did is that the walls fell down flat. You say, that's, that's, a, that's an exciting thing. I wonder how that happened. Well, I can tell you how it happened. God did it. That's right. That's right. There's no other explanation for it. God did it. God knocked down the walls and allowed his people to run in and take over the city. Notice he said there's only one, one family to be spared in there, and that's Rahab the harlot. You remember Rahab is the one that hid the spies when they came into the city and allowed them to, to get what they needed to get as far as information and go out. And by the way, Rahab, we, we're not going to go there tonight, but the story of Rahab is a wonderful story. Yeah, right. Because here she is, and, and you know, you know who she is. I mean, that's what she's called every time she appears in the Bible. She's Rahab the harlot. She's not somebody important. She's not somebody fancy. She's the lowest dregs of society. And yet she trusts God enough to take care of the spies, these men who come in the name of God, and God blesses her, and she becomes part of the camp of Israel. And you can go look it up later. But she is in the line of the right. Savior. That's right. That's right. She is. It's exciting. She's a she's a great grandparent of David. She is. Mm -hmm. Isn't that amazing? I told you, God is still in the business of taking messed up lives and transforming them. He's been doing that for a long, long time. That's right. And Rahab's a beautiful example of that. But as they go, they of course are going to go in and they're gonna they're gonna win the battle and all the rest. And God said, Now when you go in there, don't take anything. It's all accursed. Don't take anything. But get it all and bring it back to the treasury of the Lord in verse number 19. That's what you're going to do. Go get it. Bring it back to the treasury of the Lord. And so they won the battle and they did all of that. They did the things God said they were supposed to do. And then the next city that they come to is the city of Ai. It's the next battle. It's the next thing in line. But we read in chapter number 8 about what will be the conquest of Ai. But that's really the second battle of Ai. That's right. The first battle of Ai takes place in chapter 7. Mm -hmm. And it's not like the second battle of Ai. You see, in the first battle of Ai, look if you would at verse number 3, chapter 7, in the book of Joshua. And they returned to Joshua and said unto him, Let not all the people go up, but let about two or three thousand men go up and smite Ai, and make not all the people to labor hither, for they are but a few. They said, it's a little city. Let's not, let's not take everybody. Let's just take two or three thousand soldiers and we'll just, we'll just go. We'll wipe out Ai and all will be well. Verse 4. So there went up thither the people, about three thousand men, and they fled before the men of Ai. And the men of Ai smote of them about thirty and six men. For they chased them from before the gate even unto Shebarim, and smote them in the going down, wherefore the hearts of the people melted and became as water. Hmm. That's the first battle of Ai. It's drastically different than the second battle of Ai. Yeah. Right. But the first battle of Ai is a disaster because of what happened at the battle in Jericho. You see, something happened there, and, and these two cities and the outcome of their battles remind us of the importance of choosing to follow God's ways instead of our own ways. Amen. Because if we follow our own ways, it ends in disaster. And if we follow God's ways, no matter how confusing it may look to the world and how implausible it may look to others, it will be the right way. We've got to decide which way we're going to go. And these two cities illustrate that important truth better than just about anything that I know. Proverbs chapter 14, verse number 12 says this, There's a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Sure. Oh, it looks right, it looks good, but the end is death and disaster. You see, during that battle at Jericho, there was a man by the name of Achan. Achan is, I'm just guessing now, he's probably somewhere in his mid-40s because he has a family, he has some cattle, he has, he has a little bit of substance. Uh, he's been wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. He could have been one of those who was 20 years old and, and got to wander for 40 years and come back in. He could be 60 
or he could be one that was born in the wilderness, or he could be one that was just a youngster when they had to go into the wilderness. But because of his station in life, and he's a warrior, I'm going to assume he's somewhere probably in his mid-40s, maybe 50 years old. He probably grew up, for the most part, wandering in the wilderness. His parents were some of the people that when they came to, they came to uh, the promised land the first time, said, we can't go in. It's too much for us. Those were his parents. And God said, now you've got to wander in the wilderness 40 years, so that whole generation dies off. So wandering in the wilderness, Achan matures, he grows up, he gets buried, he starts his family, his parents die, his grandparents die, all the older people die, and he's in that generation that comes back 40 years later, and God says, now you're going in. And he gets to go across the Jordan River. But think about those 40 years in the wilderness. Don't you suppose that, that if his parents were with him for part of that, five years, 10 years, 15 years, they told the story over and over of how the spies had gone into the land and they chose not to go in. And they probably said, we really blew it. Because, because quite honestly, son, you were supposed to grow up in the promised land. That's where you should have grown up. And you should have had some property there in the promised land. And you should have been able to raise your family right then and there. But, but they said, no, don't worry. In another few years, maybe 10 years, maybe 20 years, 15 years, whatever it was, God's going to let you go back and you're going to have a chance to go do what we should have done. Don't blow it, Amen. Amen. You've missed out on a lot of things that God, uh, God had prepared for you over the last 40 years. But, but you're going to get it someday. And maybe, just maybe, somewhere in Achan's heart, there was just a little bit of bitterness over that whole thing. Now, now my parents aren't going in. My grandparents aren't going in. And I missed out on what I should have grown up with. And so when the battle of Jericho comes... And God gives the instruction and says, when you go in, don't take any of it for yourself. Gather it up and take it back to that treasury of the Lord. Aiken probably thought, that's ridiculous. We've been waiting 40 years for this. That's ours. God said everything in there is supposed to be ours. And now he's telling us we can't have what we're going to have to go in there and fight for. That is absolutely limited. Can you see that happening to someone? Mm -hmm. And they allow that little bit of bitterness to grow and grow and grow. And he gets in there in the battle. And we find out in chapter 7 that he saw some gold and he saw some silver and he saw some garments, some Babylonian garments. All of that's supposed to be gathered up and hauled back and put in the treasury and given to God. But he's mad at God. God has cheated him. He hasn't gotten the things he's supposed to get. And he feels like he's been mistreated and abused all his life. And now here it is right in front of him. There it is. It's right there. All he has to do is take it. And he does. He takes it. And you know what happens in chapter 7. Because of that, they go in to fight the next battle. And 36 men die. 36 husbands, sons, brothers die. There are 36 funerals that have to take place in the camp of Israel. And they're chased away, and it says the, the hearts of the people melted like water. I, you've just come across the Jordan River on dry ground. You've just seen the walls of Jericho fall down. I mean, you are at a spiritual peak, are you not? Right. And now their hearts have melted. This one incident, everything's gone. There's no hope. It's all over. Why? Well, because one man chose to follow his own way instead of God's way. Right. It's a choice that we make all the time. Right. You see, we have opportunities that face us every day. And, and along with those opportunities come some options. And the options that we choose in order to meet those opportunities will result in an outcome of one kind or another. It always does. You see, at Jericho, they have the opportunity of winning a great victory that allows them to go into the promised land and begin to claim what God has promised them. They have the opportunity to see a great miracle. 
At Ai, they have another opportunity to see another great victory won. And just one more step deeper into the promised land, one more piece of ground for one more tribe to set up housekeeping. It's wonderful. But then they're faced with the options. Do we do it the way God says to do it, or we do it the way we think is best? And they don't pass the test on the options. No. So the outcome, the outcome is disaster after that battle of Jericho. Oh, nobody knew it during the battle of Jericho. Nobody knew. I mean, they won the battle. The walls came down. They won the battle. It was victorious. It was wonderful. They didn't find out how serious it was until the first battle at Ai. Right. And all of a sudden, this little bitty town that they should have been just able to run right over chases them out, and a great slaughter occurs. A horrible, horrible outcome. But do you see what we read in chapter 8, verses 1 and 2? Look at what it says there again. And the Lord said unto Joshua, Fear not, neither be thou dismayed. Take all the people of war with thee, and arise, go up to Ai. See, I have given into thy hand the king of Ai, and his people, and his city, and his land. And thou shalt do to Ai and her king, as thou didst unto Jericho and her king. Only the spoil thereof, and the cattle thereof, shall ye take for a prey unto yourselves. Lay thee in ambush for the city behind thee. You see what God intended for them at Ai? After the battle at Jericho, they should have gone and they should have just wiped out Ai just like they thought they should. And God said, you have everything in there. It's all yours. You have it all. As much as you can carry, you just bring it back and it's all yours. Isn't that sad? If, if Achan had just held on for a little while, right. if he had just trusted God for a few more days, it would have been a completely different story. Right. Yeah. And he would have had everything he wanted and more. You see, you come to that place where you have opportunities and then you have to decide how you're going to meet those opportunities. We do it all the time. We make choices and decisions every day. Opportunities are laid out in front of us and we have to decide what we're going to do. Every day we're faced with those things and each thing is an opportunity that must be met. Some are small, some are huge and life-changing. We were just talking tonight with the Leafleys and, and their daughter's getting ready to go off to college next fall and, and David is going off to college next fall and, and Hope is there in college right now and and it's a transitional time in life, but there are a million opportunities in front of you. That's right. There's a million opportunities. You've got to figure out what am I going to do? Listen, not everybody goes off to college. Not everybody even should go off to college. Right. Some people decide they're going to go this career. They're going to go this path in life and they're going to do this or that or the other thing. And, and, and all of those are opportunities that are laid out in front of you. And the minute that opportunity comes up, you have to decide. Am I going to do this God's way or am I going to do this my way? Amen. Am I going to do this the way that seems best to me or I'm going to do this based on what the word of God has to say? With every opportunity, you have the option. Right. You can either face it by faith. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse number 2, it says, For we walk by faith, Amen. not by sight. Right. What does that mean? We choose by faith to believe what God says rather than what we even see with our own eyes. Right. We walk by faith and not by sight. Again, Proverbs 14, 12 it says, There's a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end there are the ways of death. And by the way, it's so important that God says it again. He says exactly the same thing, Proverbs 16 and verse number 25. The verse is, is repeated verbatim right there, two chapters later. And if God says something once, it's important. But when God takes the time to say exactly the same thing twice, you better pay attention. Yeah, man. Yeah. You better pay attention. And he's telling us that our own way can lead to, da can lead to danger. See, faith follows God that even if it doesn't make sense to the natural man, even if it doesn't seem to line up with everybody else, what everybody else says and what everybody else is doing. When you decide to act on faith and allow that to guide your life, it says several things. First of all, it says, I know that God cares about me. Amen. 
That's right. what I said. It, when I decide I'm going to believe God and follow Him, I am declaring to the world that I know that God cares about me. I, I'm not just on my own. He didn't leave me. Amen? Right. When I got saved, He didn't just set me out there to, to, to face the world and the devil and the flesh on my own. But God knows me and He cares about me. In Romans chapter 8, 28, it says, And we know that all things work together for good to them who love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. Right. He cares about what happens in my life. And when I don't live by faith, it's saying I don't believe he cares for me. Right. It says that God knows what's best for me. Not only do I know that he cares about me, but he knows what's best. I don't always know what's best. Right. Right. I always think I know what's best. <laughs> yep. But I don't always know what's best. That's right. We talked about it a little bit last night. But, you know... We said God is God and we're not. Amen. Right. Right. He sees the, the ending from the beginning and he knows it all and, and he knows what's best for us in any given circumstance. He really does. And, and we see it played out throughout our lives. Matthew chapter 16, verse 25. Jesus said, For whosoever shall save his life shall lose it. And whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. What does that mean? That means you can take your own life and, and choose your own direction and chart your own course and hang on tight to it, but it'll never be as good as if you'd given it over to God and let him choose and chart your course. Right. You can either save it and lose everything, or you can give it to him and gain everything. Amen. That's the choice we have to make. The options are laid out before us with every opportunity. Will we go our own way or will we go God's way? Have you ever looked back over your life and said, Lord, thank you for not giving me what I asked for? Amen. Amen. You know, it looks like the greatest thing in all the world. And then you find out a year later, two years later, the whole thing was about to explode and you're glad you weren't there. Right. And the Lord spared you. And you thought you were missing out when it happened. But you weren't missing out. God was protecting you. Right. Praise the Lord for that. Amen. God knows what's best for me. That's right. See, when I choose to when I choose to live by faith, I'm, I'm declaring to the world that I know that God knows what's best for me. And not only that, I am declaring to the world that I know God is going to provide my needs. Amen. He's going to do that. Psalm 37, verse 25. The psalmist said, I've been young and now I'm old, yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. Philippians chapter 4, verse number 19. But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Amen. When I choose to live by faith and go by God's way rather than my own way, I'm declaring that I know that no matter what happens, he's going to take care of me. Amen. He will. He's never failed one of his children and he's not about to start now. That's right. This is not the day when that's going to happen. Amen. Right. You can trust him. You, you've seen God provide your needs. Amen. I know during the during the whole uh, COVID shutdown thing, uh, some of you probably found yourselves in non-essential jobs. That means you worked somewhere other than Walmart. <laughs> Walmart, for some reason, Walmart is essential. You couldn't get your teeth worked on, but you could go to Walmart. Amen. Amen. And what did God do for you during that time? Well, for some of you, your, your job was such that you kept working and whatever it was, you had the, the income coming in. For others of you, God chose other means to provide, didn't he? Right. right. Stuff you didn't know was going to happen. God provided. Right. Because none of us are starving to death tonight. That's right. God provides, amen? Amen. He did it for us. He does it for all of his children. We're, we're not special just because we're in ministry. No, God does right. it for his children. That's right. All of his children. And he may use a job to do it, or he may use some, some anonymous gift to do it, or he may use some other means, but he can use anything he chooses. Right. God used a fish to help them pay their taxes in the New Testament. Yeah. Right. Go fishing. See what happens. 
God just has a way of providing for his children. And when we choose to live by faith, when I say live by faith, what I mean is choose to do things the way God said we're supposed to do them. By faith. Amen. Instead of the way that seems right to us. When we do that, we are letting the whole world know that we believe our God's going to provide for our needs. Amen. I, I won't say that. <laughs> I'll say that tomorrow. <laughs> so you can either choose to live by faith and declare that you know what God is going to do and how he's going to provide and care for you and have your best interests at heart, or you can live according to fear. Too many people live their lives in fear. True. You see, the word of God is clear in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse number 7. For God hath uh, given us the spirit of fear, Amen. but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Amen. Right. If you're living in fear, listen close. You're living outside the will of God. Right, right. Because you're not thinking right about who God is mm -hmm. and what God does. Now, if you're here tonight and you've never trusted Christ as Savior, or if you're saved and you're living in rebellion against God, you should be afraid. <laughs> you should right. be very afraid. Because if you die without Christ, there's no nice way to say it. You'll be in hell forever. And if as a saved person you live in rebellion against God, God has promised that he is going to chastise you. Right. And that it won't be pleasant. He said it will be grievous. So if you're, if you're lost, you don't know Christ, you should be afraid that you might leave this life without trusting Jesus Christ first. If you're living in rebellion, you should be afraid that the judgment of God is at the doorstep but if that's those things are not true for you, if you're a born again child of God, living for the Lord Jesus Christ, there is not one legitimate reason for fear in your life. Right. And there's just no reason to have it and no reason to allow it to take up residence. And when we live that way, we're declaring that God doesn't care about us. Huh. You see, when we make decisions, not the way God would have us to make them, but the way that seems best to us or that everybody says is the right way to do it, even though it violates what God says, we're afraid to follow God. And that fear will lead to destruction. It always does. Fear says to the world, God doesn't care about me, so I have to take care of myself. That's right. Fear says, I know what's best for myself. Self-empowerment is a big deal nowadays. You know, you just, you're so special and you're so wonderful. And you're the best thing in all the world. Even Christians fall into that tough. Right. They do, and, and we couch it in nice spiritual terms, you know. And we list all the things that we are. We're wonderful and we're joyful and we're forgiven and we're this and we're that and the other thing. True, that, that's true. But don't start thinking too highly of yourself. Don't dwell on that all the time. Now, if the devil's beating you down and, and bringing up your past and all kinds of garbage, remind him who you are in Christ. Do that. But don't run around telling everybody how special you are. Amen. That's not what God would have you do. Amen. That's, that's, you've taken it too far. When we, when we live by fear, we we refuse to do it God's way and we're saying I know what's best for me I'm in charge when we live in fear we are in fact declaring to the world that we have to take care of ourselves I gotta look out for myself oh you've heard it well you know how can you love anybody else if you don't love yourself first <laughs> how unbiblical can you get <laughs> I mean, find that one in the Bible for me. That's not there. You won't find Jesus saying, now stop that. Think about yourself. You were thinking about others again. Quit that. You just, you love yourself. I dare you. Find it. Find it in there. It's not in there. You know what he'd say? Quit thinking about yourself. Right. Think about others. Right. You put yourself at the end of the line. Amen. Not very many amens. <laughs> but it's true. <laughs> it's true. 
And when we don't, when we don't choose to follow God's way with the decisions and the choices and the opportunities in our lives, what we're saying is, I have to look out for number one. I have to do what's best for me. And if I do it God's way, I don't think that'll be best for me. I won't come out on top if I do it God's way. Do you, do you know that God's uh, God's program is not for you to try to come out on top ever? Right. Huh. You know, He said in First Peter. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. Right. It's not your job to exalt yourself and make sure you come out good and you come out on top. It's your job to humble yourself and let God take care of that. Amen. If right. there's some exalting that needs to be done, God will do that. It's right. not your job. It's not my job. And when we choose to try to do that ourselves, we are not living by faith in God. We are walking in fear that somehow God will fail us. And so we have to make it turn out the way it should come out. We see the opportunities every day all around us. We talk about education opportunities, career opportunities. You have to decide what are you going to do with your life? You know, a lot of folks go to college and waste several years and then come out and still can't get a job because they don't know what they're doing with their life. Right. You can only do so much with an underwater basket weaving diploma. <laughs> <laughs> Jobs are kind of scarce. And you, so you got you got to decide now, what am I going to do? Let, let me tell you what you do. You do something that falls in line with the Word of God. Amen. That's what you do. Well, the only jobs available are those where I have to do something that I shouldn't do. Well, then, it goes back to living by faith and trusting God to meet your needs right. and doing it God's way. Right. I just, I heard on the radio this very day, and the, and the person was, claims to be a Christian, and, and I believe they are from their testimony. Somebody had written in a letter and asked about, should they take this summer job as a bartender? Can I just help you with that? No. Amen. That's an easy one. <laughs> no. Shouldn't do that. Why? What well, because God says not only are you not supposed to look at the alcohol when it when it moveth it when it's fermented. And you're not supposed